brings 13 years of diesel engine and energy, experience, energy industry experience to Neste and provides technical expertise to engine OEMs, fuel distributors, fleet consumers, and internal teams. He began his career as an application engineer and then technical sales manager at Cummins before moving to a sales director role at an equipment manufacturer. He returned to his technical roots and now uses his engine, equipment, and fuel expertise to support Neste's position at the leading edge of cleaner, low-carbon, renewable fuels. Now, you might not think clean and sustainable uh, and diesel can be mentioned in the same sentence, but let me tell you, renewable diesel absolutely um, gets us outside of that rut. And Matt's here going to tell us a little bit more about it, so please welcome Matt to the podium. So... Real quick, I'm going to call out Richard for a second for something he said before lunch. We're not biodiesel. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Just want to throw that out there. So I'll pop quiz at the end. That'll be the one question. Um, and real quick, when we get done here, if you guys have questions, I'll be around. And also two colleagues of mine, Nick and Miko in the back, we're here. And if you're really nice, um, Richard and Joey might answer some questions for you also. <clears throat> so I'm going to start you guys off with a video. See if this will work. Fleet managers have a lot on their plates, from managing complex delivery schedules and drivers, to ensuring vehicles are kept in peak operating condition, to selecting resources that will help them stay on time and on budget. So when it comes to fuel, performance is key. That's where renewable diesel comes in. Neste My Renewable Diesel is a high-performance, drop-in fuel produced from 100% renewable and sustainable raw materials. It also outperforms diesel in engine performance and environmental impact. How? It's more efficient. Its higher cetane number means it provides more complete combustion than diesel. And with a cloud point far lower than diesel, it keeps right on going, even in the coldest weather conditions. With no sulfur, oxygen, or aromatics, it burns more cleanly than any other diesel. And it's one of the greenest options on the market, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by up to 80%. Make the easy choice for the performance of your fleet and do your part to clear the air. Learn more about Neste My Renewable Diesel at nestemy.com. So, as we've heard from everyone else this morning, transportation is a huge contributor to greenhouse gases in the U.S. Um, right now, it's the number one source of GHG. Between 1990 and 2015, the uh, transportation sector increased more in absolute terms of emissions than any other sector uh, producing greenhouse gases out there. So, kind of culturally and in society, people have started realizing this, latching onto this. We see the Green New Deal and all these other things. Uh, and as of 2017, 48% of Fortune 500 companies had some sort of green initiative or, or climate target in their corporate goals. So we see large companies building onto this and, and getting momentum behind cleaning up the environment. Uh, companies like Google, Walmart, Bank of America, they've all built in these targets in the future to go to completely sustainable, 100% green energy. Um, now as fleet owners, you guys have a lot of options. Uh, I know everyone here is not a fleet owner, but if you were, there's a lot of options and ways to be more sustainable about this. There's the new technologies that everyone's talking about. There's a lot of electricity, hydrogen, uh, different alternative CNGs, LNGs, things like that. Um, or there's just plain efficiencies, operating your fleet better and how you do your daily operations. So if you were to switch to renewable diesel, uh, sorry, let me step back real quick. In the U.S., there's three, over 3.2 million truck drivers in the U.S. So... I think there's 39 states right now, truck driver is the number one occupation. There are a ton of people out there that need diesel or something to move heavy goods like this around the world. 80% of goods in the U.S. are moved by a diesel engine at some point. Um, a lot of these Class 8 over-the-road trucks, you're going to average over 100,000 miles a year. If you had 100 trucks in your fleet all doing that, the long over-the-road drives like that, averaging about 6 miles a gallon, which is pretty typical these days, if you were to take that fleet and switch it over to renewable diesel, Overnight, just by making a phone call to your fuel distributor, you would do the equivalent greenhouse gas emission reduction of taking nearly 3,000 cars off the road for a year. Um, similarly, the, the CO2 abatement, the greenhouse gas reduction, equivalent to over 16,000 acres of forest and the work that it's doing to clean the air. And the coolest part about this, you don't have to do anything. There's nothing you actually have to do to change. 
Um, completely compatible with current infrastructure. Whatever in, in diesel fueling operations you have right now, nothing changes. Uh, you just drop it in and go. So it is the same truck. It, it's not a, a different option you check at the dealership. It's not a different dealership you go to. It's the exact same engine that you're already running. <clears throat> There's no infrastructure. You're not going to have to install charging stations or PV or other things to get electricity. You're not going to have to install compressors for your gas. There's no change in your part stocking. Your, your maintenance guys that have to manage all of these trucks and keep them running, they have a, a selection of, of parts and materials they need on hand at all times. Nothing changes with this. You're not adding to your inventory to keep your fleet running. <clears throat> there's, there's no recertifying of personnel. All these maintenance technicians have to go through certain, you know, testing and, and certification processes from engine manufacturers and truck OEMs and everything else. Nothing has to change here. They don't have to go get certified to work on a gas uh, CNG engine or something. And really, there's no regulatory issues. CARB, California Water Board, all these other groups have put out letters saying, treat renewable diesel as you would treat petroleum fossil diesel. They are the exact same fuel. So before we get into a little more than nuts and bolts, I just want to show you a visual here. This is the physical burning. This is what it looks like when renewable diesel burns next to a typical carb diesel. <clears throat> a lot of this, what you're seeing here is a uh, benefit of that high cetane number that was mentioned in the video. So what is renewable diesel? Kind of jump to the bottom first. It is not biodiesel. Um, molecularly, if you guys want to have a conversation about some chemistry later, we can walk you through why it's not. And they, biodiesel and renewable both come from the same feedstocks. They both come from waste and residues. Uh, here in the U.S. and Neste right now, I believe we're the largest aggregator of used cooking oil in North America. Uh, we do a lot of beef tallow from the Australia New Zealand region, a lot of fish fat and other things from the Southeast Asia region. All of this goes into making our fuel basically similar on the supply side to biodiesel, but on the process side, what we do to it makes it completely different. The picture you see there on the right, that is renewable diesel. It looks like water. It is not water, you wouldn't want to drink it. It, it doesn't have a smell though, so it could trick you. Um, it is actually literally clear like that. Um, it is, like I said, 100% renewable and sustainable raw materials. The pretreatment process we do ensures that no metals make it through this, so you get into after-treatment systems and everything else on trucks these days. There's no issue with poisoning those like you may have with other bio blend stock fuels. Um, and then we get into the engine, there's, there's some pretty solid performance benefits too. When you store this fuel, because it's molecularly it's superior to a petroleum diesel and completely different than a biodiesel. It has a nearly indefinite storage life. So when we started making this fuel in 2005 at the first unit in Finland, we took some barrels and we set them outside the, the engine lab. It's been exposed to heat, cold, temperature changes, everything else. And once a year, we'll pull a sample from that. And we'll actually do a stability test. And there's an ASTM test for stability. The numbers have not changed since 2005. <clears throat> this fuel can, it basically has an indefinite storage life, as I said. Whereas fossil diesel, it's recommended about 12 months is the limit. Biodiesel is about six months for a B100 fuel. Um, because of how our molecules work, what we are, petroleum is this big mix of molecules that all come out of the ground. It's, it's a crazy mess of stuff. Renewable diesel, if you were to look at a bell curve of that petroleum diesel mix, we're, we're just the, the center portion. We're the best part of it. So in, in chemistry terms, we are almost a pure cetane fuel. Cetane is a kind of a performance indicator for a diesel engine like you would look at octane for a gasoline engine. <clears throat> what the, the high cetane number does, it gives you a really quick combustion in the cylinder. So as soon as that fuel comes out of the injector, the engine designers, they want it to burn right there. That if it gets further out, doesn't burn quickly, it cools off and creates soot. That's why the video you saw, the black smoke coming off that fuel. When you're making less soot in the cylinder, all that stuff is going downstream to your DPF, right? Maintenance guys all hate DPFs. We're making a third less soot. That's a third less plugging going on in your exhaust system, in your particulate trap. That equates to either less frequent regens or less time spent doing regens if they are the same frequency. Um, <clears throat> as far as fleet uptime goes, DPFs and regens are a big impact. We know that everyone has issues with these things. Uh, lubricity also. So there's, a, there's a, a measure of lubricity in a fuel, basically how it protects moving engine parts like injectors and pumps and other things. There's a spec for the US. We actually choose to meet the European spec, which is tighter than the US, uh, just to give better protection for all those critical parts in the fuel system. Really what that does, it's gonna reduce maintenance intervals and costs for anything that the fuel touches, whether it's 
your underground storage tank and the cleaning process that you may have to go through once a year to clean out microbial growth and dump biocides and things in it. Your fuel filters on the truck will last longer because they're not being plugged quickly. Your injectors, which if anyone has had to do an injector swap on a heavy duty diesel engine, you know they're not cheap and they take a while. <clears throat> All those costs are reduced simply by calling a fuel distributor and requesting a different product be put in your tank the next day. <clears throat> so looking at engine out emissions here, because we get that better burn, the more efficient burn, we're looking at about a third percent, or a third less soot going into that DPF to plug up the system and cause issues operationally, uh, about 30% lower hydrocarbons, unburned hydrocarbons coming out of the cylinder. Um, those hydrocarbons are also being trapped in that DPF with the soot. Some engine manufacturers have told us directly that the lower unburned hydrocarbon emissions from our engines actually make the DPF safer because it reduces the chance of an over temperature situation, the DPF melting that you might, might have seen in other trucks. 24% uh, lower carbon monoxide, so nearly a quarter better than a fossil diesel. 9% lower NOx coming out of, the, out of the engine. And the bottom one there is really important. Zero polyaromatic hydrocarbons. It's a big word, but the aromatic part is the important part. This is the health impact molecule. Uh, aromatics, PAH especially, are carcinogenic. Our fuel does not have PAH in it when it comes out of our process. So fleets that operate around their tailpipes a lot of the, most of the day, think uh, school bus drivers with kids walking around buses, firefighters, ambulance operators, anyone that's mission critical and operating around that, they're not breathing in these things. <clears throat> One, they won't smell exhaust, they won't smell like exhaust, but two, the things they can't smell, like PAH, don't exist in this fuel. And lastly, just kind of because it's the message of the, the whole day here is the environment. <clears throat> you guys are all familiar with uh, carbon intensity scoring, basically the lifetime carbon analysis of a product. How much energy, you, you look at how much energy goes into making a product, and that energy used to attach an associated CO2 or greenhouse gas output. So all of this data here, I know it's kind of busy, I'll explain it. This is not nested data. This is from CARB, this is from EPA, uh, Argonne National Labs, uh, GREET model, and EGRID and some other EPA projects. So this is the carbon intensity scoring for different fuels that then has vehicle efficiencies laid over top of it. So this is carbon intensity per mile, not per megajoule. Um, the reason we do per mile here is because it actually, it does bring down the electric vehicle portion because electric vehicles are more efficient operationally on the road than other engines. But what you'll see here, over on the left, the green, that's renewable diesel. The gray in the middle there, that's electricity. And the, uh, the different bars are just different regions, starting uh, like the lowest electricity is uh, <clears throat> northeast mix, and then you have California, the northwest, Hawaii being out on the far right is actually really dirty because they have a lot of coal and oil-based power generation there. Notice that the, the second set of blue there, that's, that's diesel fuel, whether it's east coast, west coast, all the way to carb-specific diesel. This reduction here, you can have on the world just by calling a fuel distributor. There's nearly an 80% reduction in the carbon intensity of a renewable diesel compared to a fossil diesel. Out there on the right, you have hydrogen, CNG, LNG. They're still fossil-based fuels, so they're still putting out the same on this chart because the same extraction techniques are being used, the drilling, the fracking, the pipelining, the refining, everything else. So, like I said, we kind of ran through the quick. I want you guys to know we're not biodiesel, but we are an incredibly clean liquid fuel that can still be run in your existing fleets right now. I'm just going to tell you a little about us real quick. <clears throat> we're in our 71st year of operation started in 1948 in Finland. <clears throat> and as of right now, we are the world's third most sustainable company. <clears throat> and I would challenge you to find, <clears throat> sorry, challenge you to find another energy company on this list, much less one in the top 10 or top five or top three. The companies that beat us in this are software companies that build sustainability tracking software and things. <laughs> We're actually producing energy. We're producing liquid fuels and sending them around the world. Um, so we are the world's largest producer of renewable diesel. We have three plants around the world doing it, um, Rotterdam, Finland, and Singapore. Right now, we're doing about 980 million gallons a year. Um, we announced recently last month that we're putting $1.4 billion into our Singapore plant to double its capacity. So we'll be producing about 1.5 billion gallons by the year 2022. We're about 5,000 people in 15 countries around the world, and we're just under $17 billion in revenue. And just last week, we opened our first card lock location here in California. So while we don't do direct retail to consumer, a fleet could still use our fuel. You could either go to 
have a distributor bring it to you on site, whether it's wet hosing, tank storage, other things, or we're opening card lock locations across the state now. And some of those numbers at the bottom there, we're anticipating this year just under 9 million gallons of renewable diesel to be sold through our card lock network, um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 34,000 tons in one year. Lastly, if you just want more information, if you go to neste.com, you get the big corporate site that's hard to navigate through. Go to nestemy.com, that's our renewable diesel landing page. One thing that's on there is this calculator. You can actually play with the, the numbers and sliders and put in information for your fleet, your number of trucks, average miles per gallon, things like that. And you can actually get a, a number here that'll tell you it's equivalent to taking this many cars off the road or planting this many trees, pulling this many tons of GHG out of the atmosphere. So if you really wanna know what difference you can make tomorrow, like not future existential tomorrow, but literally 24 hours from now, go check it out and see what you can do. Matt, do you have any examples of uh, use of your product in heavy-duty non-road applications, so like public works, excavators, real loaders, et cetera? Most of, <clears throat> most of our customers are on-road. Um, a lot of that has to do with the California LCFS program. That look, it's just de it dedicates the credits and the, some of the benefits of this to on-road applications per regulations. We have had fleets do some off-road stuff, whether heavy mining equipment, uh, haul trucks, things like that. I mean, it, it's diesel fuel. You can run it. It's just that our customers tend to be on-road, over-the-highway type stuff, whether it's municipal fleets, you know, Class 8 trucking, whatever it is. All of our off-road stuff at City of Oakland is running on renewable diesel and has been since 2015. Loaders, whatever, whatever it is we got. We don't have a lot of big stuff. Um, uh, we don't have dozers, we don't have ro motor graders, but we have uh, paving, milling machines, we have loaders, so no no change. If anything, the drivers like it. Um, maybe the cetane makes it a little bit easier to start or gives it a little more pep. We're also running it in the fire apparatus, which is a pretty large, heavy-duty piece of equipment, not off-road. Um, I, I kind of expect renewable diesel to start branching out into some heavier uh, transportation modes. I don't know if you wanted to touch on that briefly outside of just the municipal fleet on-road, off-road equipment, but maybe talking about uh, maritime, aviation, and rail, because I think that's the future. Yeah, so um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the maritime world, but in 2020, IMO is changing the sulfur requirement and fuel use there to, what, from 3,500 or 35,000 ppm, whatever it is, down to 500 ppm, I think. So th there's a lot of opportunity for cleaner fuels in that market. Like you said, rail. Um, there's some rail projects in California using renewable diesel. Neste actually does have an aviation fuel group. So we do have a renewable jet fuel product that we're already working. We've done pilots with a lot of airlines, test flights around the world. We're doing partnerships with certain airports. I think San Francisco's on the list, DFW's on the list, uh, fueling some of the ground fleet with renewable diesel and also starting to blend into the jet fuel pool. So really, anything that's a liquid fuel, liquid hydrocarbon, we're, we're going to try to power. Yeah. And you, you did mention cetane. Um, we have a much longer version of this presentation, 50 slides. We could take three hours doing it. Some of the benefits of cetane that, that you mentioned, one's a quicker start, um, especially on cold mornings. You guys have to run block heaters and other things on diesel engines. Your, your grid heater has to cycle a few times. We don't really have that issue. And also the, the sound. So that typical diesel knocking sound is from cylinder pressure spikes and changes and things. And because the combustion of ours, that high cetane right at the injector tip, we actually kind of cut down those pressure spikes. So we've had fleet owners say, when a guy goes out and gets in the truck, he can tell if that truck is running on fossil diesel or renewable diesel by the sound when it starts, because it's quieter. I, I just want to say about Maritime that um, the city of San Francisco, through the mayor's office a couple of years ago, worked with the um, commercial ferry, with the passenger ferry providers at, running out of San Francisco, and they are all either running on renewable diesel or committed to running on renewable diesel after engine tests. Yep. And red and white fleet especially, no problems. They we actually, it. we just did a, a nice promotional video with Red and White Fleet. Uh, Nick back here was part of that video shoot. Uh, we could send you guys a link to that if you want to see it. Or A lot of these fleet owners also, they're, they're totally fine having people call them to ask questions. Um, we've never had one say, I don't want to tell anyone the benefits of this fuel. So if you're kind of on the fence, we can absolutely get you in touch with someone who's been doing it for a while, outside of Richard and Joey and these guys. 
Matt, uh, Matt, I know a lot of the fuel is being used in the Bay Area. I'm cu curious to know what the state is using at this point. I know they added it to their contract some time back, but I don't know how much renewable diesel they're using. Being the technical guy, can I defer that to Absolutely. someone real quick? Do, we, do, do you know the answer to that, Nick? Oh, yeah. um, Nick is our, on, on our commercial side. Any idea what the volumes might be? Uh, ETS is going to be about 6 million gallons a year. Okay. Uh, and that's all throughout California. Right. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Tom? Yeah, uh, one minor, real quick. I can yell. How long are LCSF credits going to happen? Because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm an on road guy, and renewable costs about the same as diesel number two, low cost. Correct. So that's the offset. So as far as I know, the LCFS program was recently extended out to 2030, right, with an even sharper decline curve. So, I mean, we've got at least another decade of, of the state trying to be cleaner every year. So it, it's not something we anticipate going away. Right. There, it, it's on, we, it's on par with parity, basically. It, it could go either way depending on, I mean, if you're a fleet operator and you need fuel delivered in five gallon jerry cans, it's going to cost you a little more because the distributors weren't going into it, but it's, it's not a dollar or two dollars more per gallon or anything by any means. Hey, hey, thanks for bringing up the cost, Tom, because uh, at the recent card lock grand opening, that was one of the questions in, in the answer from Neste or Western States Petroleum was as simple as, well, you know, look at the billboard that everybody sees from the freeway. It's, it's priced at, at or below petroleum diesel pricing. So cost is not an issue. And just to address the point about it being perceived as a, a new fuel, renewable diesel has been in use in the state of California for almost 10 years now. It's been mixed into the standard petroleum diesel supply available at all the retail locations. If you bought diesel in California in the last 10 years, you've been running renewable diesel, although maybe at a 2 or 3% component, but that's in order to meet those low-carbon fuel standards. Th that is a really good point. So we've been making the fuel, we're bringing it to the U.S. for over 10 years now. Um, we've just gone to market with the Nest My brand within the past few years, but in the meantime, those, those first years, like I said, it was being blended with the Chevrons and the shells of the world and everything else. I'm with Bob Brown with Western States Oil, and I would like to point out it's actually cheaper than normal diesel. When you take in the, uh, the, the maintenance and the DFP filters and everything else, it's substantially cheaper. Yeah, if, if you look, start looking at TCO, just because of the maintenance costs and other things, it's, there are savings to be had. Where does the renewable diesel come from in California? From Singapore? Right, Singapore. Yeah. Are you thinking about onshore production? So it, that's something we'd looked at for a long time, is doing hard, you know, facility here in the U.S. It gets a, a little more into the policy and the politics side, but stability-wise for us, long-term planning, it made more sense to put the money and double our Singapore capacity, partially because of political environment here in the U.S., permitting, things like that, but also feedstock aggregation. It's just we can gather all the used cooking oil in North America and take it over there, but the size of Southeast Asia, the South Pacific, all of that, it's so much closer to the facility. It just made more sense to, to put the money in over there. So as a fleet, do you all do um, certifications or verifications if we want to know that our current diesel provider is using your RD99? Is there any way that that's verified or certified? As in <clears throat> R99 without being blended with something else or Neste specific R99? Neste specific. Not yet. Right, but that won't tell you the manufacturer, though. It, it, will, it will tell you that it's biogenic, current carbon fuel, but it won't tell you, you know, what facility in the world it came out of. Uh, so with that, if you guys are going through one of our distributors, it's going to be Nest Day product. Um, so, you know, Western states, things like that. Um, look at our website um, if you guys are in a different area. But if you're buying it through an authorized reseller of us, that's the only thing that they have is Nest Day product. So it's not going to be mixed with bio or have anything else in it. And that's a contract that we have with our distributors. 
yeah, it's, it, in the longer version of this, we've got a good visual of our complete supply chain. And from the refinery, um, from the time the feedstocks come in until it hits the ship, um, we obviously control all of that. We test the product when it goes onto the ship, it comes across, lands in California, gets tested again before it leaves the ship to make sure nothing happened in transit. It gets offloaded into the tanks at the terminal. It gets sampled again to make sure nothing contaminated it. And then from there, our distributors pick it up over the rack. So it's, it's never pipelined. It's never blended with a bio. It's never blended with another, another producer's fuel. It's literally from the outlet of our plant to a distributor truck to your tank. And that's, like Nick said, that's, that's a Neste policy. That, you know, we're not going to look at a molecule and say, that's mine. But we've got chain of custody the entire way. Right. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, let's have a nice round of applause for Matt. <clears throat> All right. Once again, this, this concludes the annual Alt Car Expo here at Oakland. Uh, if you have any feedback or input, please be sure to share it with Christine or Becky on your way out. We appreciate you coming out and joining us today. And if you have any recommendations for future agenda topics or, or whatever, Please let us know. So thank you again. Have a great day.